being here. We've had tons of RSVPs for this event. Um, so all three organizers are here and a bit overwhelmed, uh, but we're here and hi, nice to see everyone. Um, before we start off, we'd just like to um, give you a small introduction to what the next five months hold for us. So, um, can everyone see the PPT? Okay. So, welcome to the Our Ladies Toolbox. Um, we start today with part one, but before we start off, just wanted to um, let you know a little bit about Our Ladies, especially the ones who are new. With the Freiburg chapter here, you can follow us at Our Ladies Freiburg on Twitter and on Meetup, where you have all the uh, events that are coming up, as well as um, GitHub, where you can find all the past events and material from the past events. Um, we are your three organizers. I'm Divya. Hi. You can see Elisa and Kyla. Wave, people. There. The three people waving at you now. Uh, you can write to any of us uh, individually on the chat as well if you have any questions um, throughout the sessions or on Meetup if you have any questions after. Um, feel free to get in touch. Um, Happy New Year. We are starting 2021 with two amazing series. We're starting with the Our Ladies Toolbox series today. And next week, we'll be starting with From Zero to Hero. Um, you can follow both these series with their individual hashtags on Twitter as well. Hashtag Our Ladies Toolbox and hashtag From Zero to Hero. They're both targeted at slightly different audiences. So the first one, the toolbox series, is a little more advanced, focused on analysis, presenting results, reproducibility, version control. And the last one is going to be on um, just a panel discussion about being women in science. Um, Zero to Hero is for basics, sharpen your skills. Um, we'll be taking messy data sets and just using tidyverse, wrangling, visualizing, ggplot, all of that. Um, so if you, you know, need to do that, need to sharpen your skills, need to get back into R, or if you know someone who is really hesitating to start R, that's the series for them. Um, let them know. Um, the toolbox series will be, um, sorry, um, the toolbox series will be um, by different people, different R ladies from around the world, starting today with Praveena. And the um, Zero to Hero series will be done by Kyla and Yulia. Wave. <laughs> you can see them here already. Um, and if you also just, you know, been with us last year for Tidy Tuesdays and you've missed that, this may again be something for you where you can like come practice the same skills that you practice during Tidy Tuesdays. And that's also going to happen once a month. So each of these is going to happen once a month, which gives us 10 series, uh, 10 workshops starting today. Um, next week, we start Zero to Hero, Shiro, sorry, excuse me for that. Uh, Zero to Shiro, part one, uh, which will be an introduction to R. So Kyla and Yulia will really take you from the basics, introduce you to R. Don't be intimidated by that. Um, and then we move on to February, where we have um, Mansi from Our Ladies Mumbai presenting results, and she's going to talk about how to get really fancy with when you're presenting, say, in Markdown and stuff. Um, we then have tidy data again in Feb. Um, we then move on to March, where we will do um, reproducibility by Charles, who's a part of Our Ladies Remote. Um, and we again have wrangling by um, in the Zero to Shiro series in March. April is going to be um, version control by Kristen, who is a part of the Our Ladies Global as well as the Our Ladies Berlin team. Um, and we finally have visualization in April um, before we move on to May. And the two in May are going to be panel discussions for women in science and some more tidyverse and GG plot to finish it all off. Um, I think these are really good series. We 
the three of us are like extremely excited about all 10 workshops uh if you read our whatsapp chat every day one of us is like oh we're so excited about this and we're so excited about how many rsvps we have and it's going to be so great um and you, there's really something for everybody in the next five months so no matter where you are what stage of are you are at you will find something for you um and i just like to say about the toolbox series they are amazing women from different parts of the world you can really learn a lot from them um they are working in very different fields um the series has been funded by the pedagogische hochschule in freiburg so the university of education and so it's slightly geared towards academia but not everyone even presenting or holding the workshops is working in academia so you will have this kind of academic industry bridge um and some of them i have spoken to before some of them are joining us for the first time everyone is really excited and we hope you are too yeah and we start off today with academic analysis um with pravina she is um the founder of our ladies chennai and is working at graduatetutor.com where she tutors graduate students and analysis and today she's going to tell us everything about k means and hierarchical clustering which we are again psyched about because neither of us um is an expert in these topics so great to have you here pravina and over to you thank you divya thank you hi everyone hi so nice to see you all here the six participants it is amazing congrats to you guys um, that's a lot of hard work i know so um am i audible to everybody can you all hear me well yes oh, okay excellent okay we do you all have the code so do you all um, have the code it's the... called our code for jan 13 Mm-hmm. The code. I will friendly. send the link. Yeah. I will send the link um, from where you can download the code. Yes, please, please open that up so you can work along with. Me. And while you're doing that, how many of you know what is? Shall we begin while you're opening that up? Shall we begin? It might take a couple of minutes to. Um, okay, we'll wait then. Everyone's downloading. Um, just to. um let you know if you have any questions like if any of the participants have any questions you can also post it in the chat and um one of the organizers i'll probably keep an eye out on the chat and pravin i can interrupt you if needed and if not then you can just continue with your material right and just another quick note we are going to be recording this meet up so um if you don't want your video in it or your audio just make sure you turn it off and you can always ask questions in the chat. Okay, thank you. Yet another note. <laughs> We will be uh, giving out certificates to everyone who attends all five um meetups like all five of the toolbox series. So if you attend all five of them and if you're interested in receiving a certificate from our ladies tribe that you've attended all five and you've uh, taken like you participated in this immense um analysis series then just let us know with your full name in um the chat and we'll keep a tra- we'll keep track of that um and make sure that you're logged in with your name as well in the participant list so don't have any uh like log in with the name you want on your certificate okay i hope you have all opened up your r code now we're going to start uh, we're just going to start talking about um, the different types of machine learning you can have supervised learning as well as unsupervised learning what is unsupervised learning what is an example what would be an example of unsupervised learning if you had a data set of spending by customers in different categories it, i mean the columns would the, the rows would just be the names of different customers of a supermarket and the columns would be dairy grocery meat and so on so there is no um, there is no response there you just have input variables in a way you just have 
you do not have any output variables. So you want to find a structure in that data, uh, this, this data which does not have any labeled observations. And that's what you mean when you say unsupervised learning. You are just grouping your observations into different clusters. For example, you could have maybe a, a cluster of high income individuals who spend a lot of lot on organic food. You might have um, another cluster of individuals who spend a lot on um, food that is not as healthy for different reasons. So in unsupervised learning, you are not trying to predict anything. You're not trying to predict whether this customer is going to spend um, a certain amount of money. You're just going to group your customers into different clusters. On the other hand, supervised learning, going ahead with the same example, you could make a prediction like regression or classification based on your data. For example, if you were trying to predict, if you had the amount spent by customers over a year, and if you were trying to predict how much they would spend the next year, that is a continuous value for regression that you're predicting. So that is supervised learning. You are, uh, based on your observations, you are trying to predict uh, regression for an unseen observation. Or you could also try to predict whether the customer will you know, buy a certain expensive product next to that could be a yes or a no. In that case, again, it's classification for unseen observations. So these are our, these, this is how you differentiate between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Now, we are going to learn unsupervised learning today. We are going to learn both clustering and dimensionality reduction. Uh, no, actually just clustering today, but clustering and dimensionality reduction are what you do uh, in the case of unsupervised learning. Now, what is clustering? Clustering is just finding subgroups within your larger group. So you're going to find uh, patterns or hidden patterns or groups in your, un, uh, in your unlabeled data, like, the, um, like I just mentioned for the supermarket example. Now, there may be more than uh, you there may be more than one way in which you can do clustering. For example, if, if going by the same supermarket example, if you had, you could, you could predict or you could cluster your customers based on the amount spent on uh, perishable goods, amount spent on non-perishable goods. Uh, you could cluster them based on the average age of the family members, um, the average amount of money they spend in a year. So there are different ways um, in which you can cluster them. There is no, there may be more than you know, one right way in which you can cluster, okay? So that's one thing. So uh, what we're trying to do here is, if, if you suppose you have your, your customer data set and you make 10 clusters, you want all the observations in one group to be similar and the observations to be different from one group to another. Now, this is an unsupervised method because there is no response variable as such. Now, what could be some applications of clustering, visualizing data, also um, marketing programs, then um, customer segmentation, student segmentation. These are all applications of clustering. We are going to look at two kinds of clustering today. One is k-means, the other one is hierarchy. K-means clustering, you are partitioning observations into a certain number of subsets based on how similar they are to each other. And you have to, you have to specify the number of clusters, which is not always possible. So a couple of things that you need to remember when you do k-means clustering is that, um, you, your rows must be uh, observations. For example, if you are, uh, if you if uh, if you are taking the example of the customers, then each customer, each customer spending is in one row, and then the columns are variables. The columns are where you do, you know, where you do your, um, you have the values for um, dairy, grocery, etc. Any missing values must be removed, and you have to scale your data. These three things you need to remember. Um, when you do 
cluster analysis in R. But the most common method to do cluster analysis is k-means clustering. So I would like you to open up your, your R code. Please open up your R code. Sorry, I just would like to ask you something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you share your screen or not? I'm going to share it now. You're ah, opening okay. up the R code now, and I'm going to share it now. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you all have your code ready? Now, okay, k-means, which we're going to look at now, is actually, it's a, it's a centroid-based cluster, which means that each cluster is represented by a central vector or a centroid, and which this cluster, this, main, this centroid, need not even be part of your initial data set. So the centroid corresponds to the mean of the points that are assigned. So you keep, this is an iterative process in which you keep assigning um, points to various clusters, observations to various clusters, depending on how close they are to the centroid at any one point. We're also going to look at hierarchical clustering after this, and hierarchical clustering has an advantage in that you do not need to um, give it the number of clusters, and also you get a good uh, dendrogram as your output. We're going to use a data set here, which is actually, before we do that, I'm just going to start. Please do, please run the code in search package data set. I just want to show you how to do it with the iris data set at first okay are you all ready should we begin okay so i have this code here and i'm going to just use the iris data set the built-in iris data set and please run this with me set c20 so we get the same result every time Please um, look at the head of your iris data set here. Okay, so this is this. You have your all, all these four values as well as the species for your iris data set. And then I'm going to set a seed of 20 because I want to get, I want to be able to reproduce these results. And then I want to show you how to cluster, um, that is line six, how to cluster this using petal length and petal width, okay? And with n start 20. Now, what is n start? To understand n start, you have to know what, uh, how this algorithm works. n start is just the number of initial configurations that are tried out before the best one is chosen. Like if you have an n start of 50, then it tries out 50 different configurations. Seeds is just so that uh, each time you run your code, you get the same answer. So first, you're going to specify your, um, what you do here is you specify your number of clusters, which is here, three is your number of clusters, and then you select K objects from your data set as your centroids or your cluster mean, and then the observations in your data set are assigned to the closest centroid based on the Euclidean distance, and then you keep recomputing the centroid by, um, and then you keep reassigning your observations to the iterative process. Now, I'm going. We already know there are only three species in this data set. I'm just going to run this to give you an idea of how that works. Okay, so I'm going to run that code here, and then I'm going to look at I one. 
you can see that I I1 is actually k means clustering. Now, what is this? What is this clustering vector? Can anybody tell me what is this clustering vector? And what what does this mean? What you, what we have done here is we have done, we, we already know there are only three species in this data set. So I use this um, value of three here just to show you how this works. So when it okay means clustering, we got three clusters here, that's this, of sizes 50, 52, and 48, which means each cluster, uh, the first cluster has 52, the second has 50, the second has 52, and the third has 48 here. Now the cluster means here are the mean values of petal length and petal width in the three clusters. Now what does this clustering vector mean? The clustering vector just shows you to which um, cluster each particular observation belongs to. And then this value shows you how good your clustering is within cluster of squares by cluster. So these are all the components that are available in your clustering vector here. So this is just an example for just to show you how clustering works with um, this. Now there are also you have all these components here, right? The cluster to which each component is allocated. This is the you know the centers of the clusters. This is the total variance of the data and so on. The size of each cluster here and so on. All these values here. Okay. So this is the output of your k-means function. Now what you're trying to do is this value. Here, 94.3% is what represents the compactness of your clustering. That is, how similar are the members within your group? And that's what you're trying to maximize here. Now, how do, in this case, we knew there were only three clusters because you have only three species here, but you don't really know that in other cases. So, how then do you find the optimal number of clusters? Now, you have several methods to find the optimal number of clusters so i'm now going to show you how to do that with this data which is please run this this is a built-in um a package called cluster data sets and you have this data here which shows you the uh, the nutrients in in different kinds of food in 1959 please run that and let's look at that Pravina, quick question does this method always yes. seek to balance the number of elements among clusters? No, no, never, never, never. No, here we knew that, um, uh, like I said, this is just an example to show you how clustering works. Just to show you the different components before we go. So see, we gave this number three here because we know that there are only three species in our data. If you... Um, do head iris here you can see that there are only actually three species here it was a virginica and then saint toes i think one more but normally you don't do you don't know that we have to figure out imagine that this um this column is not there we are trying to classify this data uh, all this data based on these values imagine this column if this column is usually not there if it is there yes you can test the accuracy of your clustering but usually it's not that you're just trying to cluster it based on these values. So I'm going to show you how we can choose the number of clusters with this example. Please run that um, line 15. Should be there in your R4, data nutrients, meat, fish, whole, and nutrient. Please run that. The first way in which you can find the optimum number of clusters is called the elbow method. Um, the elbow method seeks to just show you how your model quality changes as the number of clusters changes. Give you just one thing um, while I'm doing this. I do have um, a Word document with my notes, but do I need to share that as well now along with the R code? That's what you're reading off from, right? Like that's what your notes are. We can um, put yeah, but I have it. Yeah, fine. Okay, uh, but all the code is there is here yeah. now. now. What we're gonna do here? We have uh, several ways in which you can find the um, the optimum number of clusters. One is called the elbow method. What you do? What you do in the elbow method is you 
you are running k-means multiple times and you see you get a, a scree plot a scree plot will will have a point like an elbow where uh, you can see that as you keep increasing the number of i'll show you that shortly as you keep increasing the number of clusters you do not see any improvement in the quality of the model that is as you make your model more complex that is increase the number of clusters the quality is not improving anymore so that elbow shows you the number of um, clusters that are there in the data i'm going to run this and show you what that is okay do you see this Okay, so as you increase the number of classes after a point, there is no improvement in the model quality. So that is why you have, um, so that's how you choose the number of classes. So you would choose it at a point where you can see the model is not, the quality is not increasing anymore. Uh, when I say quality, what it does is the total, um, the within clusters are squares, the variance within clusters is minimized. So you're doing k-means clustering here for different values of k, and for each uh, k, you find the total uh, within cluster sum of squares, and then you plot the values and note where that occurs. So one way to do that is with this um, with this f is nd cluster function from the library facto extra. That is one way to do it. We also have the average silhouette method that just shows um, how well an object fits within the cluster that it assigned to. So if the silhouette width is really high, that means the clustering is quite good. So the optimal number of clusters would be one which maximizes the silhouette width. So again, uh, we can use this f is nb class function here, again from the factor extra package to get your optimal number of clusters. And here you can see the optimal number of clusters in this case is three. Okay, so when you get the silhouette width, and if the silhouette width value, um, we look at that in a moment. We look at um, silhouette silhouette widths in a in a minute. Okay. Can I ask you a question in between? <laughs> yes. Cool, because um, I run it um, in parallel, and I also saw that my data is organized in a different way. So right now I got. Uh, a number um, of four. So the fourth <laughs> cluster is the optimal, but maybe it's because the data is organized differently. How, how about how do you mean it's organized differently? Are you using different data? Uh, no, I'm I'm gonna running um, your um, script, but also the okay. cluster means were different in the example. Um, the order was different. So I did you did you set your C to twenty? Yeah. Here? I, I would just double check. So I just want to. Sorry, can I just intervene and say I've got the same thing exactly. I got three clusters but ordered differently. So it was exactly the yeah. same clusters ordered differently with the K means method. And I got four clusters when running the silhouette. Okay, method. great. Yeah, me too. Okay. Um, four clusters when you do. Did you run nine, five, or six? Oh, you're talking about this one, right? Did you do this? Did you do all this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there are a few people who are getting four. Um, there are a few people in the chat who've written they're getting four. Getting four, okay. Um, I can look at that afterwards, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay, so then we come here. What we do here is we can also use this nb cluster function here and we can try to get the the optimal number of clusters let's run that here okay so you have your yeah, the output here you can see according to the majority rule the best number of clusters is 10.
So one more thing here is, is this much clear? The Diplar pipe operator? That's from the Diplar package here, the pipe operator. So what you do here is, this is your data, two to six, which means we have not used the first column. It's, it's, it's all the you know, names of different types of food. So we're using two to six, and then we are uh, we use it. this is min n c is actually the minimum number of clusters is a maximum number and then this is how you get the um the number of clusters now how can you visualize this again library factor extra and please run this line where you do yeah it shows you the optimal number of clusters is ten. So we're going to do it now with 10. I'm going to run k-means now with 10. And looking at C10, this is my clustering vector. These are the clusters, and this is your, your cluster means here. So you have k-means clustering here with 10 clusters of varying sizes. Suppose you had more than two variables that you were uh, trying to do clustering with. And then you, this FS cluster here would do PCA, principal component analysis, and plot the data points according to, you know, those that account for the most of the variance, those, those columns that account for most of the variance. Now I want to show you. Now, how can you how can you measure the quality of your clustering? What do you do to measure the quality of your clustering? There are two ways in which you can do that. You can do silhouette width, like here, where you run that. These are my row names, which is the first column. Okay. So you do the silhouette widths and you see each cluster, the neighbor and the silhouette width here. And let's visualize that. Okay. So looking at this plot here, this shows you average slope with this point four four, and there are no negative values here. Because if the value is slope value is negative, what does that mean? Slope values can be positive. You want them to be as high as possible, or um, you know, negative or even zero. So here we see there is no, uh, there are no uh, slope bits that are negative. Because if it's negative, that means the observation was placed in the wrong cluster. And if it's zero, that means it's actually between two clusters. So here it's fine. There are no negative values. Now, just in case you had negative values this is what you would do you would do um you could run this to see if there are any negative indexes in this case you don't have any see there is no um a no observation which is in the wrong cluster so that is one way to find out if your um if if your clustering is of good quality that is using the silhouette bit there is one more method that is using uh, the fpc package uh, Pravina, before you continue, there's another question. Yes. There are several measures of distance, um, Euclidean, right. etc. Is there any way to determine the best distance measure to determine the clusters? Yeah, yeah, just a second. Just a second. I'm going to that now.
we have functions like get this and f is this which you can use to visualize the the differences the distances between observations so if you that would just uh, show you which would be you know which are farthest away in terms of distance but to find out you you have options where you can choose for distance measure you're going to use but if you want to find out which is the best method we are going to look at that now when we do parity clustering then you're going to choose uh, which method is the best can we look at that now Okay, and now we are going to look at the second way in which you can assess the quality of your clustering, and that is by uh, using the Dunn index. So, second thing. If you have a high Dunn index, that means your data is clustered well. For example, you would do you would do this first. You have to find your um, k-means using the eclust function here. Run this plot. And then you run this plot, and then you can also get a silhouette plot. The okay, number of clusters is two. Two clusters, and you have your sizes and your average silhouette width here. Now, how do you find the done index from that? If your data is clustered well, that means your done index is going to be really high. So please run that code. So you have um, library FPC and then cluster stats here, and then this gives your done index. Now we also need to visualize our data, our clusters. So for that, I would do library uh, factor extra and then cluster it this way. Okay, because we used C10, suppose we're using C10, we would do this. Now I also want to show you how you can get, uh, how you can su summarize this using the plot. Uh, summarize the data by cluster. So, this is how you add using the pipe operator, you add your cluster to this particular data frame and you group it and then you can summarize um, all the observations by the mean. So, that would be here. You have your clusters which has been added and then you have your energy protein, fat, calcium, iron, etc. So, these are your means in each of the clusters. That's what this um, this code does. Here. Okay, that's how this works. So now we have grouped our data and we have summarized it using k-means clustering. Okay. Should we move on to hierarchy of clustering now? Should we move on to hierarchy of clustering? That's part two of your code. Same um, R code that you have, but part two. This is also unsupervised learning, hierarchy clustering, but there are some advantages over k means clustering. One is you don't have to specify your number of clusters, and also you get a dendrogram. Now, we use mainly two types of algorithms here. Um, agglomerative and divisive what are the differences agglomerative is when you have you you can do it in two ways with the h plus and agnes function and what you do in the um agglomerative algorithm is you consider each object as just one cluster and then you keep merging these clusters so it 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 works if you have smaller clusters this method works agglomerative clustering works and there are two ways in which you can do it with the H plus and the Agnes functions. We also have divisive hierarchy clustering where you, you consider it all, uh, everything as part of one cluster. So that's better at um, 
you know, dividing into larger clusters if your clusters are originally larger and then you go ahead and you keep dividing it into smaller and smaller clusters we use the diana function now uh, two questions that are important here are how do you measure the dissimilarity between observations in r for example uh, by default you can use euclidean distance to measure the dissimilarity and it can be computed with the get this function but what if you had um, what if you wanted to measure the dissimilarity between clusters of observations that is during the clusters of observation there are different um, different methods here to find the dissimilarity between clusters of observation. So there are different uh, linkage methods that we can use. Again, as earlier, uh, your data should be, you know, each observation should be one row and each column should be a variable. You should remove missing values and need to scale your data. When, you, when I say scale, I mean that you should have, your variables should have a mean of zero and a standard deviation just to make everything you know, comparable to each other. Again, we're going to go ahead with the same data set that we used earlier, the um, nutrients one. So, suppose you're doing agglomerator clustering with the k-means, uh, with the h-plus function. I would, again, set my c20, and then I would do uh, data nutrients here, same thing. Remove all missing values. In this case, I don't need to scale my data because it is all um, it's all comparable values. And now I'm going to calculate the Euclidean distance here between customers. You get the distance metrics here. Method is Euclidean, and then hierarchical clustering here. Method is complete. And I'm just going to get a a plot here. I want you to look at this plot now with the dendrogram. Okay, so this is the cluster that you get here. Now, suppose I was doing it with the Agnes function. Again, I would do this and get the agglomerative coefficient as well. Now, how can you find out which method for Agnes, for example, gives you the best, um, the strongest? Uh, clustering structure. For example, if I had these methods to evaluate, and I would write a function here with Agnes M2 method equals X. And then using the Perl library, I would map all these methods to this function. So when you do that, please run that. It shows that the word method gives you uh, gives you uh, the best and the strongest clustering structure. So we now go ahead with word here. Okay, and that is your your dendrogram. Now, what about divisive hierarchical clustering? That can be done with the function Diana. So. Let's go ahead to do divisive hierarchy clustering. You get the divisive coefficient in that, and that again shows you how strong your data is. Okay, how strong your uh, clustering is, and that is your device coefficient. You visualize the dendrogram there as well. Now, with the distance metrics, I'm going to do a, a H class. I'm going to cut this into four clusters now. I want to see what um, I want to get those four clusters. Let's just do dev off first, then we'll go back. Quick question again. Yes. Can we can use we... categorical variables in clustering? You Is can, but you would have to. Control? Yes, yes, but you would have to do one hot encoding. Okay, that's, I know. Um, um, student and not student, then you would have to use zero and one for uh, hierarchical clustering because you have to have numerical variables.
Now, in this dendrogram here, we can see that um, how do you, you know, how do you cut your how do you cut your dendrogram into clusters? So that the height at which you cut it controls how many clusters you get. It's just like the K in K means clustering. So for that, we can use the cut tree function here, where this gives you the number of clusters that you're going to end up with. So how close, how do you say that two observations are close to each other? It depends on the height at which you cut the tree. It doesn't matter how close they are along the horizontal axis. So how can you find the um, the number of elements here you in each cluster? You have four clusters here. So you run table tree one, and that shows you how the um, in the distribution, the population of each cluster. How can you then add the cluster of each um, observation back? Okay. You can also draw a border around the clusters. So for that, you would just do um, you would just do like this. You would do f um, this dent. I think you have this in your code. H So run that. Okay, so you have your four clusters here. Okay, you have your four clusters. Now, how can you add these clusters back to um to your data? You can also do you can do um, you know you can just take not the first column which has names of the different food groups but you can run this and that gives you you know the cluster is added back to your data you can also do it with the entire data frame if you wanted the names as well to see which cluster each each food belongs to okay that's how you would add it back Now suppose you wanted to visualize your result, then how would you do that? You run this first, which is just you know the 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 values, not the name. And then I do f this cluster like this, which okay, so you have your clusters here. Adding it back here to your data. And again. This is another way instead of table in which you can find how many uh, the, the population actually of each cluster. Another way to do it. You can do the same thing with your Agnes tree and your Diana tree. You're cutting it into four groups like we already did for the H class tree. You can do it here again, uh, just like we did with uh, the first kind of tree. Now again, here, how do you find the optimal number of clusters? You have the elbow method, the average slope method, gap statistic method. There's so many ways you can do it. We're going to do the elbow method here just like earlier, but the, the code is slightly different here. This is, um, you can also do it with a function, with a long function, um, you know, write a function to do it, but this is um, probably the best way to do it because it does it for you. You can also do that with the, the you know, use the same F is N B cluster for your average silhouette method. So that's here. And then you can see. Okay. Hope you're all getting the same results. Seven seems to be the number of clusters. So I'm going to now have a, I'm, I'm going to cut my tree and call it tree seven with K is equal to seven. And then I'm going to see um, the population of my clusters here. Okay, so these are my clusters and the population of the cluster. I'm adding it here. Adding it here.
and this is a visualization with a cluster of a cluster called true seven and this is a visualization of your cluster this is from the average limit method now how do you uh, how do you measure the quality of this uh, clustering again it is like we did earlier we have to go to library facto extra and do an enhanced hierarchical clustering that's what this does so this is from this fpc package and we find the distance metrics and then we do this enhanced hierarchical clustering here and that gives you the within cluster sum of squares as well as the average silhouette width so this is how you can do it with the F, uh, FPZ package here. You can also do it with CL Valid. That is another package which is um, actually much simpler to use, where you um, just do, um, you know, you just find the distance matrix, and then these are your cluster objects. And there's a number of clusters here. So if you run, um, if you run this done, you get the done value, and you need to have um you know a done value as high as possible so this uh, cl method cl valid library package also helps you find whether your clustering is good or not okay so these are the two methods of um, two methods here you can also um there are, there are several other functions i mean several other packages that help you with this but this should give you an idea of uh, how to do um you know how to do how to find the quality of the clustering that is both with silhouette width and with the done index okay any questions what kind of done index are we looking for we are looking for a done index as high as possible You're trying to see if your sets are, um, you know, if your sets, your clusters are similar to each other and they are as different as possible from the other clusters. That if you, you know, you have your central needs, right? So those need to be as different as possible from the other clusters. So if you have a higher done index, that means your clustering is, um, is, um, is good. It's, it's a good quality. Using the dist function, so dist open brackets, close brackets, should we standardize our variables first, like set scores? Sorry, sorry. sorry, did I broke up? Oh, sorry. Using no. dist open brackets, close uh -huh. brackets, should we standardize uh -huh. our variables first, like z scores, so that there are no statistical artifacts between uh, because of the metric? No, we did that first with scale, right? We don't need to do all that again. We're scaling it first and that's enough. And then converting all categories. We don't have categorical variables in this example, but if you did, then you would need to convert them into you know, numbers, zero, one, numbers like that. Like dummy variables, you need to do that. But um, here you don't have any categorical variable. Your input has to be numerical for um, both hierarchical clustering and Haman's clustering. You have this um, this um, this function here, the distance matrix, um, and this is just you know, this is just your distance matrix cluster is just you know your, this object here. This is a number of clusters. The cluster object is here, and that again can be um, you know, this is a method here. If you are, suppose your um, method here is just average, how you get your distance matrix. So the index can vary anywhere from zero to you know, any value and you just need it to be uh, the maximum possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I think that seems to be all. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will share the um, the Word documents with the notes and the code. And maybe people can take some time to try it out if they'd like right now and you'd be available for questions. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll share it now. The, uh, mm -hmm. 
Should I send it to you, both the documents? Sure, I can forward it. Yeah. So if anyone would like to play around with the data, try out everything that Ravina just showed us, feel free to do that now. Um, I guess it was quite fast for everyone to keep up. Um, but you, we still have um, enough time for you to play around with it and see what happens. Uh, I would like to ask you something, if it's possible. <laughs> it's a very stupid question. So um, I run the whole script at um, at the same time, and everything is working. And mm -hmm. and then I just um, because I saw that there were some bugs and I couldn't fix it. So my question is: um, Do I have to pay attention when I'm gonna run the not one thing where the two percentages are in the larger line thingy? So it's at the, uh, at the beginning um, um, where we, we're gonna install the package NB class and deep flyer, and then there's also this NAT1 um, NM data 226 and then percentage thing. Um, could you please repeat your question? Uh, is it part one or part two that you're having a problem with? Um, part one. I changed the uh, line, so I couldn't give you the line. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Can you just read out the line, please? Yeah. Could you switch the script? Yeah. Cool. And yeah, yeah. Stop. there is it. Uh, Ninety. Ninety. Okay. Yeah. yeah what? Or above there is okay. also the the not one thing. This this was not working. Maybe scroll above. What li what yeah. line is this? Not um, um... at the beginning. This one? Yeah, exactly, 32. Okay, yeah, what, what is the problem? Um, so I just run this line and then uh, um, there was an error message and I was wondering um, if I have to, I mean, I also run the line 32 to line 35. Okay. But this was not working. Okay, can I, um, what is the error message? Uh, it couldn't find uh, the not one. Yeah, okay. maybe. Ah, I see. Uh, I got a response. Maybe it's just about the plot window. No, not one is what you're doing now. It's from NM. You're getting uh, not just for nutrient. You are uh, making this data plane now. Yeah. So um, can I? Can I? Uh, yeah, I. I um, I mean, it's what working it? when I run the whole script. Maybe I just investigate a bit more time to figure out why this whole line is not working alone. Did you run this line? Line yeah, 18? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In that case, you should not have a problem with line 32. Um, so it says it can't find that one, but you're making that one now. You're just producing it now, right? It was not there earlier. Yeah. What does it say exactly? Just it can't find that one? Can you share your screen? Sure. But it's in German. Ah, but I need that um, the host should uh, assign or allow me to share my screen. For Did the they, time being, share? yeah, for the timing, we can just allow um, participants to share screen as well, and then as a co-host after you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that should work now. Okay. Um, yeah, but now you have to um, stop sharing your screen, then I can share my screen. <laughs> yeah, I'm stopping, stopping. Stopped. Cool, thank you so much. You're welcome. So this is my screen, can you see it? Yes. Awesome, so for example, 
uh, if I'm just going to run this line. You can't, run, you can't run just that line. Do you know why? Because you see the pipe operator at the end of it. No, please, please stop. Please stop. Do you see the pipe operator line 60? Do you see the person? No, just line 60. Yeah. You see the percentage and the greater than and the percentage? Yeah. That is the pipe operator. What it does is it, it, it is waiting for the rest of your code. It chains functions together. So uh, okay. what that, okay, so what that line really means is you're going to take nm two to six, nm and the columns two to six, which means that is the uh, no, the initial data with the nutrients data, except for the column, except for the column with the types of code. You know, taking all the other columns, and you are passing it with a pipe operator to the nd class function. So that is why you cannot run only line sixty. You have to line run from sixty to sixty four together. But I also did this and not working. Not working? Nope. But if I'm going to run the whole script, it is working. So maybe I just have to look what's going on here. Maybe it's uh, my R Studio version is not up to date. I have no idea, but sometimes. What does your error say? I, I, I don't. Yeah, it's don't just understand. not finding um, the not one thing because it's not working. So it's well, I think, sorry. <laughs> I, sorry. So, so, it's also saying that it's not finding the function. And I, I think if, I mean, it's a bit small by my screen, but it says that the function is not finding, it's actually the pipe. So maybe if you try library deep layer before running. Oh, install packages, you need to have that, uh, you, know, you need to have that um, the, um, the, um, the inverted commas. Sorry, oh, sorry but I also, I also, I'm so sorry because I also um, run the library, but maybe, yeah, okay. Yeah, but so in, was, sorry. Yeah. My mistake, inverted commas, line 57, you need to have those, you know, inverted commas for install packages. Deploy? Yeah, yeah, it was just I had to run the uh, library again and now it's working. And one more comment. So, this install <laughs> packages, when you do it, it's installed in your computer, so you don't have to run it every time. You can comment it on your code. But the library is loaded in the package, so that, that is something you should run every time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, I just thought okay. I already did, but yeah, sorry. And thank you so much for being patient. It's <laughs> fine, that's fine. We have a few other questions, Ravina. Yes, please uh, go ahead. Just a second. <laughs> Okay, I think we start here. Um, Amelie, do you still have that question? Uh, the same no, issue no, with the I, plot? No, I'm fine. Uh, okay. yeah, thanks. I, I solved it and I saw that was related to Marike. Okay, perfect. There's about um, the same lines, but I'm fine. Thank we you. We don't have any other questions. <laughs> no, that's a moment. Just for, sorry, <coughs> just me with my four clusters instead of three. It would be nice to sort it out, but I don't know whether we can do this now or we Sure, can there were actually a few people who had this problem, so... Um, can you share uh, your screen? Be possible, Olivia? Yeah? yeah, of course, yeah. It's, um, it's free now. Um, like, I, I've given you access, like oh, all yeah. the participants have access now. Should I do it from the beginning? Where, where, um, which line is this? Um, part yeah. one, right? Yeah, it's part one. So if um, uh, I'll do it from the beginning. Sorry. Um. So if so seed. Set seed is 20. Mm -hmm. um, and if you see here the order in which the clusters mm -hmm. are classified is different from the order that you had. It was in a different, you see? So here, for example, yeah, you see the clustering vector is three. 
one and right. two for some reason. And if I carry on executing the code, um, sorry, there's something bugging me here. Um, took. Yeah, if you see them here, here is the plot, the average silhouette width, and it shows that the optimal number of clusters is four instead of three. That's from, um, that's line 21, right? It is line, that's the elbow method now, line 24 here. It's, um, line 20. Yes, exactly. With the silhouette method. I think it shows, I don't remember what it did with the elbow method. Should I run this one as well? Um, this is with the elbow method. Mm -hmm. You see that there is improvement here as well, I guess, around four. Improvement of the total width, sum of squares. Yeah. And line 23, it also outputs optimum number of clusters equal to four. Um, Someone um, so suggested if the EDIS data set has been changed between data sets package versions. All right. Uh, I'm not sure. Does anyone have an idea if that's happened? Right. I but don't think so yeah. because the data set, Iris data set is used so many times nobody wants to change it. Um, <laughs> but um, I have another idea I, because R, uh, the, the pop-up window asks you if R should be restarted after the installation. And if R is restarted, the set seat command is uh, lost. Maybe it's just you have to, to uh, set seat 20 again, again. to reproduce the results with the three, uh, with the three cl clusters because uh, after okay. the restart of R, it won't be there anymore. Yeah, or actually, um, just like now that you have installed the packages, you can just comment that line, and then you. Yeah, and the difference between uh, the presentation and and our code is just the installation. So mm -hmm. maybe this is the reason yeah. why uh, we got different results. Maybe. Okay. Well, I'll I'll keep playing with it and re reset the seed, set the seed again, and see whether. I still get three clusters, if I would get three clusters or not. So I knitted it from the start, and when I knitted from the start, I still get four clusters. Yeah, I did it as well. I restarted our studio, and yeah, I'll try again. But I don't know how to unshare. I don't know, my configuration is all got muddled up, sorry. I want to unshare my screen. <laughs> um, if you just move, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Um, Pravina, is there anything you would still like to add? Um. No, no. Uh, yeah, please just run this code again and, you know, like maybe install all the packages once and then um, not be installing it again and then run. You should be able to get the same result because I get the same result each time I run this. That's why I chose Iris because it is so simple and it would, you know, give you an idea of um, how the clustering works for gametes since we already know the number of species that are there. If anyone does come up with a possible solution to this that we haven't solved yet, uh, maybe we can just put it in the meetup. Um, yeah, so I probably, sorry for interrupting again. I, I, I think it's what uh, it's been said before that it's that you didn't, that when you start the package, then R is restarted and then the set seed is not set anymore. So, I mean, there are two possibilities. Either you set seed every time after, um, restarting or since once you install the packages you don't have to install it anymore either you uh, erase the line where you start the package not where you load it 
So not the library line, but the star package line, or you comment it. Uh, and if you comment all the lines where it says install packages and then you run it, try that, and uh, you might get the same result. Because I think it's that problem that you are not setting the same seed. And this, all these models have some stochastic part. And that stochastic part will be different for everyone if you don't set this seed. Yeah. Oh, in line 24, could you please, um, you know, add the, could everybody please add the inverted um, the commas on deploy line twenty four install packages deploy. Uh, yeah, but it's it's interesting that we do know that there are three different types um, in the Iris data set, but all mm -hmm. of us who hadn't set any um, any seed values got four clusters. So it is a little bit surprising because I would assume that most of us would get three clusters with a random number. Um, and not four, but there were but many you, which which have uh, have a result with four clusters. And uh, right, I would assume that is because the initial clustering is not. I mean, the initial of the species assigned would be based on other factors as well, not just these four, um, these two columns that we are considering, not just columns three and four. So it might be based on you know where it's found, um, um, you know, how much water it needs the habitat, so many other, you know, there could be so many other reasons for that assignment. So we are doing yeah. it based on just, you know, these values. Yeah, maybe they are similar subtypes or something like that. Right. Right. All right, then. So if there is um, nothing else to add, um, sorry, just a stupid question here. I'm going to show myself up really. So, sorry, on line eight, I1 uh -huh. mm -hmm. is K means of iris, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. And then on line yes. 16, uh -huh. and M is. is NM is sorry. just the uh, nutrients data, but you're omitting uh, anything which has yes. NA values. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the. What we're doing underneath, we're using an M, we're looking at an M, which is another data set, right? That's not Iris, right. or is it? No, 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 no. Iris is just to see this line. No, no, please let me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Shall I, shall I tell you? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, no, I wasn't sure you were done. See, Iris line eight is just to give you an idea of how to do clustering. Yeah. Okay. Just to give you an idea, because we already know we have three clusters. Just to show you the output and what are all the com different components of the output, how you can see the clustering vector and all that. This data that is from line 14 is not clustered. It is a data set from the cluster.datasets package. It just, if you look at it, it just gives you, um, you know, it has a column with types of food and then, you know, protein, calcium, etc. So th we want to cluster that there is no, uh, no, um, it's not clustered. It is unlabeled data. We do not, we are trying to do it now. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, somebody was entering the waiting room and I'm getting these um, messages. Sorry about that. Um, but that, that, the data set we are using here is actually the nutrients make fish data set. Iris is just an example. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? Anything that hasn't been clarified? I know this seems like um, a little hard at first, but um, if we, I, I'll send the notes along and then that should, uh, you know, the notes are, um, I mean, I have notes for both uh, K-means and her article, so then this should really, um, you know, become much clearer after that. Because it has, you know, the plots and everything in, um, in one document, so it should be much easier after that. Yeah. You'll have Ravina's um, cheat sheet the next time we're doing something like this. Mm -hmm. I'll send it along now. Yeah. So we'll uh, put up all the material, the code, everything on our GitHub. Um, maybe one of us, um, Elisa, could you share the link?
the GitHub link. We'll just share the GitHub link um, in the chat. All the material, code, everything will be available there. Um, the entire session has been recorded and will be available on YouTube latest by the weekend. Um, and so you can re-listen to everything, go through the discussions, go through the material. Um, and yeah, if you want to refresh um, your R skills in like next Wednesday, the 20th, same time, same place, we're gonna start with introduction to R from, from R zero to hero series. Um, the ones here, I guess, do not need the introduction to R, but I'm sure you know somebody who does, so send them along instead. Um, and we will see all of you the first week of February, where we have um, Mansi from Our Ladies Mumbai talking about how to make your markdown tables and your markdown reports in general, how to present your results um, in fancier ways. So, yeah. And I hope everyone who wants the certificate has written in the chat. If not, you have another minute to do so. Um, Elisa has just put the GitHub link as well, so you have that. And I hope everyone enjoyed. Thank you, Praveena, for the amazing session. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys.